Uh, I want to uh, first of all thanks, uh, thank the organizers for uh, for the invitation to come out here. It's really, uh, it's really lovely out here. Um, so the the talk that I would like to present here is uh, a joint work with Sergio Polito that I think uh, m most of the people in the room know, um, and also uh, Eduardo Abi Jaber, who is a PhD student of uh, Bruno, that we have uh, borrowed. Um, and, uh, but, but we'll give him back, uh, maybe. Um, so this is going to be uh, about affine Voltaire process, and I'll, gonna, I'll, I'll tell you what that is. Um, what got us started with this, what motivated us to, to, to look at this problem that I'll describe, uh, is this recent uh, literature on rough volatility models. And as we heard this morning, uh, there is a lot of empirical evidence that uh, volatility time series are uh, exhibiting a behavior uh, rougher than, uh, than Brownian motions. And uh, from the point of view of, of uh, standard models for stochastic volatility, that, that is an issue because those typically do fluctuate like Brownian motion. And so, so there is this literature that develops models that can uh, cope with this uh, feature that you see in the data. And uh, I've mentioned a couple of, of, of papers here. Um, now, there's a, many more of them out there. And unfortunately, this community is very organized. So there is actually a website that is maintained by Blanca Horva, where there's a huge list of papers that deal with uh, rough volatility. So you can go there and look up the literature if you're interested. And, but there are especially two papers here that I want to uh, mention uh, by uh, Omar Elush and uh, Mathieu, which were really uh, the starting point for us. Um, and I'll review some of the things that they, they do there. Um, so this is where our motivation uh, came from when we started working on this. So before... Uh, talking about rough volatility models. Let me just go back to the uh, usual volatility models. And this is, this is the most, probably the most common stochastic volatility model, which is the Heston model. And uh, everybody knows this model. There's, a, there's a, a return here, which is proportional to some Brownian increment. And the squared variance process, squared volatility process, follows the square root diffusion. Okay, so this is the Heston model. Um, one nice feature of this model is that you can calculate the uh, characteristic function of the log price um, in closed form, where you can express it in terms of solutions to uh, quadratic ordinary differential equations, these Riccati equations. Um, and, and, and you get this very nice expression of, of the characteristic function of the log price um, that allows you to derive, for example, option pricing formulas. And this is uh, the uh, primary reason why this model became important and popular uh, initially. Um, all right. So now what, what Omar and Mathieu do in their paper uh, is to study a variation of this model where instead of just uh, so, so, so the, the basic specification of the price is the same, but the squared volatility process looks different. So instead of integrating this uh, stochastic differential here, they convolve this stochastic differential with some kernel, which has a singular behavior. So the alpha here is between 1 half and 1. So alpha minus 1 is negative which means that this kernel uh, explodes close to zero, and that causes uh, the solution of this equation here to have trajectories which are less regular than those of Brownian motion. Okay? So that's what they do. Um, this model, uh, first of all, is, is, is very similar to, to the riemann level fractional Brownian motion that was uh, first introduced by Levy in the 50s in that it uses this convolution kernel here and convolves it with, with Brownian motion. 
Um, it also has features that are attractive from the point of view of this uh, empirical uh, findings that I mentioned before. In particular, it has, it has uh, paths which have a regularity, hold a regularity, uh, less, you know, alpha minus one half minus epsilon, so it makes it, it's rougher than Brownian motion. And this particular model also has a nice feature that it arises as a scaling limit of Hawks processes, um, that, which also Mathieu uh, was alluding to uh, during his talk. Um, and, and you know, the way it's uh, built is it sort of gives it a, a type of mi microstructural foundation. So this is very nice. Um, there are, uh, you know, you, you look at this and you, you think to yourself that this, is, this, is, this, this looks non-trivial because um, this is an equation for x. And uh, just by looking at this expression, it's perhaps not immediately evident whether this equation even has a solution. Uh, and it might also not be evident whether this solution is unique. Uh, and there are many things happening here. Uh, in particular, so this, this is not going to be a semi-martingale, for example. It's not going to be a Markov process because uh, there is a rather strong dependence on the history of x when you try to uh, uh, get an idea of what, what, what's going to happen next from, from time t onwards. Um, and uh, because of these things, it's not completely clear how you would uh, find a useful description of its law, uh, similarly to the very nice and explicit expression or, or description that exists for the Heston model. All right? So it's not exactly clear. Now, in the, in the paper uh, by uh, Omar and Mathieu, they construct this process, they construct the solution of this process by passing to, to this uh, scaling limit uh, of a sequence of Hox processes. So it's, you know, its existence is, is uh, obtained there in, in this way. Uniqueness is uh, proved um, in, in another paper uh, using SPD methods. Um, but what about this last point of how to usefully describe its law? And this is where um, Moir and Mathieu obtained a, a, a result which uh, we found remarkable when we first saw it. So let me, uh, let me state it. And here I'm using uh, this notation, which is the riemann leville fractional derivative of order alpha. OK, so it's defined through this expression here. So what they show is that you know, the same thing still works, basically. OK, so, so now what they show is that if you now have a solution C of a fractional Riccati equation. All right, so here on the left-hand side, you don't have a standard derivative. You have a fractional derivative. But the right-hand side looks exactly the same as before. OK. Um, then you, know, you, you define functions phi and chi by essentially um, you, know, you, you integrate this, the, the deriv this fractional derivative, and then you integrate chi. Right? And uh, in terms of these functions, uh, phi and chi, you can again get this exponential affine uh, expression for the characteristic function of the log price in this model. All right, so this is a rather remarkable result, especially given that you know, uh, we don't have any semi-martingale Markovian properties here. So when we saw this result, we thought, OK, um, uh, you know, why is this happening? Right? So um, how can this be? Now, of course, that's in a way is a silly question because you know there's a proof in the paper, right? Um, uh, but this proof relies on uh, the scaling limit of Hawks processes, and in, in some ways comes as a byproduct of of other things such as you know obtaining existence of solutions to this equation in the first place. And so we were wondering if if it might be possible to analyze uh, this model on the level of the limiting stochastic equation. You want to directly study uh, this equation here and obtain existence uniqueness, prove this type of result, and so forth, in the hope that this would uh, not only, hopefully, you know, be able to not only recover what they did, but also ideally get more general uh, statements, such as, for example, conditional characteristic functions here, or characteristic functions of the joint process consisting of the log uh, price and, and the squared volatility. Um, and, and then you know, also perhaps consider more general specifications. 
Um, all right. So then, you know, we went back to the, you know, how, how, how you usually do this um, for standard affine diffusions. And, you know, how do you, how do you get the characteristic function of a standard affine diffusion? So let's, let's just have a quick look at how that works. So, so this is supposed to be an affine diffusion. That means that B depends in an affine way on X and sigma squared also depends in an affine way on X. And um, the way to compute its characteristic function is through three steps, okay? So first of all, you define a process M by this formula where phi and psi come from the Riccati equations. Um, now, you apply Ito's formula here and you use that phi and psi satisfy the Riccati equations to see that this M is actually a local martingale. And because of the way you chose the boundary conditions of this uh, phi and psi, M capital T is equal to UX capital, A, E to the UX capital T. So now this M is, a, is, is not only local martingale, but really martingale, then, then you, you, get this, um, you get this, right? Which is, which is what you want. Uh, Okay, so this is how it works in the standard uh, situation, but of course this is not at all going to work for the rough CIR process um, because the right-hand side here uh, is certainly not going to be a martingale if X is a rough CIR process because it's not even going to be a semi-martingale. Um, also, there is no reason to expect that this conditional characteristic function here will depend on x only through its value at time t, because it's not a Markov process. So we, you know, this kind of expression, there's no reason to expect that this, this should hold, and it doesn't hold. So, so this is not a good starting point to try to uh, extend the standard way of viewing affine processes. Um, there is, however, a different representation of the conditional characteristic function of a standard affine process which um, you see less frequently, but uh, which is actually uh, very nice, and it's this one. So here, the, so now I put a log here, so I don't have the exponential on the right-hand side anymore. So, so the log of the characteristic function can be expressed as, a, as an expression which is affine in the conditional expectations of future values of, of x, okay? So remember, A is affine. So this right-hand side depends on, on these conditional expectations in an affine way. And then it also depends on the solution of the Riccati equation. So this is an alternative representation of the characteristic function of an affine diffusion. And now there is some hope, because if you look at this, um, you know, there is no immediate reason why, why the right-hand side here should not be a semi-martingale or why, you know, e to the power of this right-hand side would, should not be a martingale, all right? So here, here is a bit more hope. And in fact, this is the expression that nicely uh, generalizes to that situation that we are considering here. Okay. So the, the framework that we decided to put ourselves in and which turned out to be a, a convenient way of studying this problem uh, was to look at this class of processes which we, uh, in, the, in the paper we call these affine Voltaire processes, you might want to call them affine Voltaire process convolution type. So these are stochastic convolution equations, all right, um, where you have a, a drift part and you have a diffusion part but these stochastic differentials are not just integrated, but convolved with some kernel k. And the data for this problem is a state space uh, in Rd, some initial condition. And again, the affine uh, dr diffusion drift coefficients uh, have this structure. So we, we have this affine structure. A here is equal to sigma times sigma transpose on the state space. Okay, so this is kind of the usual setup you would have for affine diffusions. Uh, but the new ingredient now, of course, is this kernel K, which is some locally square integrable matrix valued function. Okay? Uh, so, and, and now, the, uh, regarding just briefly the meaning of this integral here, this is, of course, to be understood for fixed T. This is an Ito integral, and there's nothing, there's not a problem here, and that's why we need L2 here. Okay? So, this, this is the class of process. Now, just. Um, 
to point out that if you let your kernel be constant and equal to the identity matrix, then you get an SD. Um, if you are interested in the rough CIR process, then your kernel should be this fractional kernel here, which has a singularity at zero. And if you're interested in the full rough Heston model, your kernel will be a two by two matrix with one here and the fractional kernel in the bottom right corner. Okay. All right. Um, so here is uh, one result which uh, basically shows that, that you know, this representation that, that I showed a couple of slides back is indeed the one that generalizes. So here, um, what, what we do is we assume that we have uh, our process X. We assume that we have a solution C to a convolution equation. Um, this is a quadratic convolution equation because A of C is a vector which depends quadratically on the unknown function Ψ. Okay, so this is a quadratic uh, integral equation uh, which uh, we refer to as the Riccardi Volterra equation. And uh, if now we define a process y through this expression, then e to the y is a local martingale. And if it is a martingale, then we have the uh, conditional characteristic function that we want. Okay? Um, of course, this uh, is expressed now in terms of conditional expectation of, of the future, of, of future values of the process. Um, so we would, of course, like to compute those as well in order to really have a, a nice representation. And this is, this is rather easy to do. So I'll, I'll just uh, briefly show you how that works. So what you do is you take your equation, you take expectations here. This guy is not a martingale as t varies, but it has zero expectation, okay? So, so when you take expectation, this goes away, and you end up with a linear convolution equation for the function that maps t to the expected value xt, all right? And this equation you can solve using a variational constants formula, which involves what's known as the resolvent of this kernel kb. So this is, this is sort of a standard thing. Uh, and you, you can do a similar thing for conditional expectations, and that gives you a nice expression here. Okay, now this result uh, assumes a couple of things, and what it assumes is that you've somehow managed to prove existence of your process X, existence of a solution to the Riccati equation, and that uh, this local martingale in the theorem is really a true martingale. So these three things you have to somehow check, and you have to do that when you have a concrete specification of state space kernel diffusion drift coefficients. And what we do is, is, is to basically carry out this for three classes of, of, of state spaces. One is RD, then you get something like a volterra ornstein ulmbeck process. This is a rather easy case because everything is Gaussian. The more difficult cases are these two, the, the Volterra square root case where your state space is, is, is the orthant, and the volterra heston case where uh, the state space is you know, R times R plus, which you know, is where the log price times the squared uh, volatility lives. Um, so I want to say something about, uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, I just want to say something about the volterra heston model because that is the one that, that you know, where we started with. So um, here the dynamics uh, is, is, you know, exactly as, as in the rough Heston model, except that we have perhaps a more general kernel. Um, the riccati volterra equation in this case looks rather simple. And we're going to make an assumption on the kernel, which is that it's completely monotone and has some controlled behavior close to zero. So this just means essentially that uh, k is, uh, it could be singular, but it, has, it, it explodes with some controlled rate. Okay? So in this case, uh, what our theorem says is that we do have unique in law, okay, uh, weak solutions of the, of the uh, stochastic equation for any initial condition. Uh, the paths of the squared volatility process have the right regularity. And also for a suitable uh, uh, class of initial conditions, the riccati volterra equations have unique global solutions. Furthermore, the Martingale condition in, in, in our theorem is satisfied. Okay, so we have this. And, and, and as a bonus here, the process is a martingale, okay? So there are no bubbles in this model, all right? Okay. 
So, so we sort of, in this case, we get, we get what we want, and, and you know, we have similar results also for the square root case and, and, the, and the ornstein Ulbeck case. So now, uh, the last two minutes, uh, I will uh, say something about, um, I'm not going to say anything about the proof, but rather just say something about why we need this assumption of complete monotonicity. And um, this is uh, related to what's called a resolvent of the first kind. So that is an, another kernel L, such that when you convolve it with K, you get a constant function, and this constant function is equal to the identity matrix. So this kernel L could be measured. If, if K is 1, then L will just be Dirac mass at 0. Um, if K is a fractional kernel, then L is another fractional kernel, which is precisely the one that appears in the riemann leville fractional derivative. Okay? So, th so that's, uh, that's what's known as the result of the first kind. And here is where complete monotonicity enters the picture. If K is completely monotone, then this thing always exists, and it has behavior that we can say a lot about its properties. Uh, in general, L does not exist, okay? but for completely monotone kernels, it does, and that's why we need this assumption. Um, now, why is it useful? Well, here is one technical result, but I want to include it anyway, because I think it says something about uh, why this L is important. So, um, Suppose that it exists, okay? L exists. Uh, we define uh, function pi by this quantity here. And you can think of this as uh, uh, measuring the deviation from Markovianity, okay? If, if, k, if k is constant, then this expression is zero. Um, so, okay, so now under some regularity conditions, we can actually express the process y, which appears in the exponential, it appears in our exponential affine formula, as an affine function of the past trajectory of x. Okay, so we can express it as a function of the past trajectory of x. And the crucial point here is now that by controlling, if we are able to control the signs of these quantities and, 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 and this measure here, since we know that x is non-negative in the square root case, that allows us to, to bound y, basically. And this is one way to uh, check the Martingale condition, and that's why this L is so important. The similar uh, uh, things happen when you try to prove that your solution is really non-negative. Okay? You use this kind of stuff. Um, also, it, it gives us an exponential affine transform formula, which is now really exponential affine in the past. Okay? And as you can see, in the Markovian case, pi is zero, these two terms go away, and we're back to, a, uh, to a, something that depends only on xt. Okay. So uh, that's what I wanted to show. Uh, the kind of what, what, what we're showing here is that, you know, we get these type of nice, uh, rather, you know, explicit uh, expressions, even though we don't have any semi martingale Markov structure. Um, another message that I want to really uh, convey here is that a lot of what we do relies on basic uh, tools from stochastic analysis plus classical techniques from the theory of Volterra integral equations, deterministic Volterra equations. There's a book here that's very nice. Encyclopedia has everything. This is really a great book. But there's a lot of things we don't know. Uh, so, you know, regularity of, of the solutions of Volterra equations. The Riccati equations, pathwise uniqueness, we have no idea. Numerical methods, bound retainment is also something. And of course, we'd like to look at non-convolution kernels. That's also something. Stationary case, we're integrated from minus infinity, and so on and so forth. So I'll stop here. And thank you very much for listening. So I was going exactly to ask about the stationary case. Does it change anything if you want to start from minus infinity instead of from zero, your processes? What, what changes in the model? Uh, we don't know. So that's on one of the unknowns in this list. <laughs> so so I, I, I mean, uh, this is something that, that would be nice to, to get a better feeling for, because we don't really want to start it from a deterministic initial condition in a non-Markovian model, right? Uh, but we haven't done it. Why isn't there a very cheap way to get around this Martingale problem in, in, by taking just u 
uh, to be uh, imaginary, so taking the Fourier transform in, instead of the Laplace transform, then everything is bounded and you shouldn't have a problem between... Um, well... You must have that the you local... Would, you, need, you need that this y is bounded. Or, or rather, you need that e to the y is bounded. And even if, even if u here is imaginary, okay. you cannot guarantee that y, which depends on the solution of the Riccati equations, will, will remain bounded. You need to show that it remains bounded. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no, exactly. So the, 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 even if u is purely imaginary, c, the solution here, will not be purely imaginary. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. And can you say something about uh, evolution of moments, moment explosions um, of these Volterra um, FN processes? Um, no. Uh, we're, we're working on that. And it looks as though um, moments are, are trickier here than in the standard case. But that might be just because we don't yet have found the best way to write it. Um, but this is something that we're working on. And I, I mean, I expect these things to have, to have finite moments. Uh, but uh, this is work in progress. No, but exponential moments. Ah, exponential, exponential moments. moments. Ah, sorry. Uh, OK. Uh, exponential moments, um, well, so again, I mean, the answer, the answer unfortunately is the same. So again, I would expect that it will always have small exponential moments, but again, we don't have a proof of that. Any other questions? So let's thank Malcolm again.